bloody Tarawa, one square mile of hell. It was just a little sand spit in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, less than three acres in total square area. But this particular island called Basio in Tarawa Atoll had a runway built on it, and thus making it an unsinkable aircraft carrier in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It was just one more link in the chain of Admiral Nimitz's island hopping campaign in the Central Pacific. It was going to be a tough job, and that job was given to the 2nd Marine Division. The island was inhabited by about 5,000 Japanese troops, most of which belonged to the Special Naval Landing Force, or Japanese Marines, the best they had. And Admiral Shibasaki, in charge of all of these ground troops, had once boasted that a million men in a hundred years could not take Tarawa. The 2nd Marine Division will do it in 76 hours with 20,000 Marines. The invasion date was set on the 20th of November, 1943. Now this bodes interesting because on that same exact morning, it would be the lowest of low tides around the island. And that would pose both good and bad for the Marines. Good in that the, with the water being lower, they had a coconut log seawall to hide behind as soon as they got off the landing craft. Bad because the island was surrounded by a coral reef and some of this reef was exposed and these landing craft that the Marines were coming in on would get stuck on that coral reef. Now there were two kinds of landing craft that the Marines used that morning. One, the LCVP, or Landing Craft Vehicle or Personnel, and two, the LVT, Landing Vehicle Tract, or Amtrak Amphibious Tractor. Now there was only about 125 of these Amtraks available that morning. These would be the vehicles to get the Marines to the beach. These tracked vehicles could go up and over that coral reef and all the way through to the beachhead. The LCVPs, a plywood uh, boat with a much deeper draft, ended up getting stuck on this coral reef. Now there were two sides at the island that the Marines could invade from, the northern shore and the southern shore. The northern shore was much shallower, that faced the lagoon in Tarawa Atoll. The southern shore faced the ocean, much deeper water. So Admiral Shibasaki decided to put most of his heavier defense weapons on that southern shore facing the ocean, a lot like the weapon system you see behind me. This is a Japanese 25 millimeter triple barrel anti-aircraft gun. When it became evident that the Marines were going to attack from that lagoon site or northern shore, he tried to move as much of these defense positions as possible to that northern side. Now two days prior to the Marines invading, this island was pummeled by uh, Army Air Corps bombers and Navy battleships. And after two days of heavy bombardment and tons of ordnance dropped on it, it was thought that not a single human being could survive such a pulverizing punishment. But the Marines would be proven wrong two days later, when almost all of those 5,000 Japanese troops were alive and well, waiting for the Marines to land. Now the landing beaches got cluttered that first morning, 20 November 1943, so cluttered that most of the Marines couldn't even land that first day. Some were actually circling in their Amtraks for over a day, waiting for a hole on that beach to land. The beaches were full of damaged landing craft, broken equipment, and broken bodies. Death was everywhere. Of these four main invading beaches, Red Beach 1, Red Beach 2, Red Beach 3, and Green Beach. There were 16 M4 Shermans. Now this is the first time that the Marines are going to land M4 Shermans during World War II. Of these 16 Shermans, only three were left remaining operational after that first day. Now with just a small toehold on the island, the Marines were fearful that there would be an organized resistance later that night, a sort of bonsai charge. That resistance did not happen, and that's what allowed us to remain on the island and fight for three more days. The Marines did not know that Admiral Shibasaki was killed that first morning, so no organized resistance was planned. On the second day of battle, the Marines crept slowly inward, and their advance was measured in yards, mere yards on this small island. It was a bloodbath as they pushed inland, but they had to take this island, and we needed this airfield for support of more operations. On the third day, only a few pockets of resistance remained, but fighting was still fierce. Finally, on that fourth day, at about one o'clock in the afternoon, a small American flag was raised on a coconut log palm, and now the island of Tarawa was secured. Its cost, however, was very heavy. Of the 5,000 Japanese troops there, only 13 were left alive. 
and of the 20,000 invading Marines, over 600 would be killed in action. The fighting was so fierce that there were four Medal of Honor recipients awarded at the Battle of Tarwa, but only one would live to talk about it. That one was Colonel David M. Shoup. Now, Colonel Shoup was the youngest colonel that the Marines had in the 2nd Marine Division, but he was charged with the daunting task of developing this invading plan. Ironically enough, after he devised such an incredible invasion plan, he was charged with being the one to lead it. So Colonel Shoup landed with his Marines on that first day of 20 of November, 1943. And although Colonel Shoup wrenched his knee very badly on the way in, he remained in charge of all of the Marines on the island. He maintained command and control with very poor communication on the beaches. After that first day, a small message was sent back to one of the Navy ships. Issue in doubt. There was no way of knowing if we were going to be able to hold Tarawa after that first day. But Colonel Shoup rallied his Marines and stayed in charge until he was relieved on the third day. Colonel Shoup was one of only four Medal of Honor recipients and the only one to walk away. The other three that were awarded posthumously went to Alexander Bonnyman, William Dean Hawkins, and Staff Sergeant William J. Bordelin. Now, William J. Bordelin is a San Antonio resident. And if you come to the National Museum of the Pacific War, you can see Sergeant Bordelin's Medal of Honor on display here in our exhibits.